to our third lecture on the skin series. And I'm going to be talking today about skin lesion identification and skin biopsy site selection. And I, I provided a series of notes that really detail this um, with <clears throat> lots of information. And, and today I want to go through a case-based approach to try and highlight some of the basic principles related to um, correcting, collecting our skin biopsies appropriately and kind of maximizing our results. And so I think it goes without saying that um, the skin biopsies, it goes without saying that the surgical biopsy is the most powerful diagnostic test in veterinary medicine. Rapidly able to diagnose hundreds of diseases and processes while differentiating multiple concurrent conditions. There's no other test in veterinary medicine that really approaches this level of usefulness. Unfortunately, the surgical biopsy, and in skin biopsy as well, it's an invasive, costly test where misapplication is really quite easy, which leads to a negative or misleading result and to diagnostic delay, ultimately more cost to the client and uh, pain and suffering to our patient. And so all um, biopsies that end up with a nonspecific biopsy result are biopsies that were um, inappropriately collected. There was misapplication of the test um, and we didn't end up with a diagnostically useful result. And that can be avoided by having really a um, an approach that kind of helps us select our patients and our biopsy sites and our lesions to maximize their usefulness and to avoid those where we're not going to get useful results. So an approach might be here that I've outlined in five steps is select an appropriate patient. Not every patient is useful to biopsy and, and the biopsy won't help them. And if we do have an appropriate patient that we try to identify all the skin lesion types that are present and then it's important to prioritize these skin lesions into primary and secondary lesions. We're trying to target the primary lesions for skin biopsy and avoid the secondary nonspecific ones. But still, within a primary lesion, there's an appropriate place to biopsy in order to capture the underlying pathomechanism of the disease. And if we don't find those right sites in our primary skin lesions, again, we'll still miss the, um, the, the location, misapply our biopsy, and end up with a nonspecific result. And, and it's important that our biopsy type and number match our problem. Sometimes just by choosing the wrong biopsy type, we can end up with a suboptimal result. And the number of biopsies is always critical, and your pathologist is always asking for more, and we'll kind of see why that is in a bit. And so as we identify our patient and we then look at for skin lesions, we're looking to identify the individual skin lesion types and to, to know those kinds that occur in dermatology and to be able to separate them out and prioritize them. We're really trying to find those primary skin lesions, those skin lesions related to the underlying pathomechanism of the disease that are, that are diagnostic um, and are most useful for us to target. And we're really trying to avoid those secondary lesions of uh, skin lesions that are not diagnostic. They evolve from primary ones. They are usually a result of chronicity, often a result of self-trauma, and they provide no more useful information for diagnosing our patient than what we can see in front of us in the clinic. Now, a problematic are some lesions can be primary or secondary. Alopecia, for example, is a classic example. And it might be self-trauma leads to secondary alopecia. And some of our primary alopecia diseases, however, that's a really important primary lesion. And the way we sort that out usually is clinically. When did these lesions show up in the course of disease? Did they show up early? Did they show up without self-trauma? And these kinds of clues help us determine whether or not they're a primary or a secondary lesion. Of course, we choose the correct biopsy type to optimize the results. The ones in veterinary medicine that are used most often in dermatology are punch biopsies, shave biopsy, and wedge biopsy. And by and far, punch biopsy is the most commonly selected tool. There are some very specific examples where that will lead us astray and get us suboptimal results. And we'll show you um, some of those examples. It is also important to get the, a, a correct number to get an adequate sample. And it's very unfortunate to go and collect on a patient samples and not have an adequate amount of material to make a diagnosis. We usually only have one shot, one time, where we can get uh, our clients to allow us to do a biopsy. And we want to go there and get an adequate sample that time and not have to try and come back and do it again. So we want to use um, the larger punch biopsies. Uh, we want to just basically throw out all those punch biopsies for six millimeters and down and focus on the eight millimeter punch biopsies. 
So if it's, we are going to punch a hole in the skin and it's going to take the same amount of time to heal, we want to get an adequate sample for that. There's really only a few places in the body where small punch biopsies might be useful, on the face or on the eyes, nose, ears, for example. And there, even a wedge may be more appropriate because it's easier to close. And so ideally, for the vast majority of cases, we use an eight millimeter punch. And I still receive four and five millimeter punches from systemically ill patients with severe and generalized skin disease. Um, and I only have this little bit of tissue to work with. And that's unfortunate when we miss a diagnosis on a critically ill patient. So we'll start to now look at some cases. And we'll start with case one, mixed breed dog, four years old female spade, chronic dermatitis, persistently pruritic and develop skin lesions, unresponsive to antibiotics. And now in each of these cases, we'll try to deconstruct them, just identify the skin lesion types that we see present, and give a definition at least the first time when we see them. So in this patient has really clear evidence of lichenification, that's thickening of the skin, and you can see um, that there's accentuation of the skin surface folds, there's folding of the skin, it would be palpably thick, um, for that, and that, that the skin is hyperpigmented as well, and you can see that there are discrete areas of pigmentation are small and large areas of hyperpigmentation. And dermatologists like to call these macules when they're flat and discolored and they're less than a centimeter, or patches when there's discoloration of the skin that's flat and greater than a centimeter. There's also some erythema present and erosions, so off to the lower left on the, at the tail head. Um, in here as well, and there's extensive, extensive alopecia <clears throat> on this patient. So then if we look at that, at our differential diagnosis, there's really only one main differential diagnosis here, and that's flea allergy dermatitis. In a pr primarily pruritic patient with lesions directed to the caudal dorsal one-third of the body, this is a primary uh, pretty patient and flea allergy dermatitis would be number one. This is not an ideal patient for biopsy. It's not recommended. It's not recommended to biopsy any patients in which pruritus is the primary feature of the disease. It's the primary, uh, one of the primary mechanisms of the disease pathogenesis. And particularly in this patient where all of the skin lesions are considered to be of a secondary type. Lichenification is always a secondary skin lesion, the result of chronicity. Hyperpigmentation, equally so. Erythema, erosions, and alopecias might be primary or secondary, but in this patient with pruritus, uh, early onset, these are all secondary lesions and are not useful and won't be specific. The biopsy results on this are quite predictable, eosinophilic perivascular dermatitis that's hyperplastic, and that hasn't differentiated anything for our, our patient. In fact, our biopsy is unable to separate many of these primary pruritic diseases. So here on the left and the upper left, we have a patient with sarcoptes that's pruritic, we have a, a dog with chronic atopic dermatitis and extensive alopecia that's pruritic. Maybe it's acute onset atopic dermatitis with papules, erythema, and edema that's pruritic. Or a cat with symmetrical facial lesions with self-trauma that's pruritic. <clears throat> and, and as with our flea allergy dermatitis patients, the lesions might be severe. They may be dramatic. They may be un, not responding to, to clinical therapy. But still, the biopsy provides us no new useful information. It is still um, going to be a concern for allergic disease or, and or ectoparasitic disease, and both of those situations have an eosinophilic hyperplastic dermatitis on the biopsy sample, and we haven't helped the patient. There are pruritic patients to biopsy, and those are our pruritic patients that have skin lesions that are not explainable by allergy, ectoparasite, or self-trauma. So they're pruritic, but they have some other skin lesions. So I've shown two cases here of epitheotropic lymphoma, and a significant percentage of epitheotropic lymphoma patients uh, can be pruritic, but they have generalized erythroderma, generalized scaling, they may have depigmentation nays, nose and foot pads, they may have papules, plaques, or nodules, many kinds of lesions that are not typical of our allergic or ectoparasitic patients. And then we do want to biopsy those lesions um, that are not related to self-trauma and the pruritus. So patient selection is key. Um, there are some patients just to avoid and it's not useful to biopsy. And these are primary pruritic diseases, for example, or for example, when you're dealing with endocrine alopecia. So if you've narrowed it down to some type of endocrine alopecia, 
most of these look similarly on a surgical biopsy and it requires specific endocrine testing in the patient to help sort them out. Now true there are some changes in Cushing's disease or hyperadrenocorticism that we can capture on a biopsy but by and far there's not a lot of new information gathered on our endocrine alopecia cases by biopsy. We're searching for a patient that has active primary lesions present. We're really trying to avoid secondary lesions that are of no diagnostic value. And so it might be that our patient uh, needs to come back to us, that the primary lesions are not there, and we're going to do a lesion watch and search for new lesions to develop that may be more valuable to biopsy and wait. We also want to avoid uh, bacterial biopsying bacterial pyderma. All the lesions of bacterial pyderma can be readily identified clinically and learned to be identified, and they can be avoided by surgical biopsy. It's an expensive and invasive method to diagnose bacterial pyderma by biopsy, and so that can be solved clinically. And additionally, the bacterial pyderma complicates the underlying problem. That, that inflammation obscures and makes it harder to see what the primary problem in the patient is. So we want to treat that, clear up those lesions, and then go after what's left if there's something worth biopsying in that patient. We also want to avoid patients on medications that have modified the lesion character and make them less diagnostic. Steroids and other immunosuppressive drugs are the best examples. We wish to avoid these. Ideally, we're looking for two to three weeks to be off steroids before biopsy, but really each patient's response to steroid treatment is quite different. The potency of our steroids are different, the routes and doses are different, and each individual patient will have to be assessed if it's appropriate, um, if there's appropriate enough time off steroids for us to biopsy. In some of our unstable patients, we may not be able to get them off steroids to biopsy. If the lesions are fulminant and progressive in the face of steroids, well, there may be time to biopsy while they're on steroids already. So let's go on and look at some more cases. Case 2, a Weimariner, 4 years old, male castrated. This uh, dog presented with a sudden onset of painful raised lesions on the face and was presented for emergency, this emergency the same day that lesions developed. And here you can see on the right that lesions targeting the muzzle, multifocal and raised. They're quite small. If you look close up at the left and the right side, you can see that these raised lesions have um, dark red hemorrhagic crusts on the surface, or uh, an exudate there. They're erythematous, um, and they're multifocal and coalescing. If we deconstruct that for the lesion types that are present, the primary lesion here is a papule. Papules are raised lesions less than a centimeter, and they're almost always a primary lesion, and that there is a hemorrhagic crust on the surface. Crusts are dried accumulations of inflammatory cells, fluid, necrotic tissue, that may or may not include um, microorganisms. In this case, when they're red-black, that's a clue to hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is a clue to rupture or loss of the epidermis. There are only blood vessels in the dermis and not the epidermis, so when we see hemorrhage on the surface, we know there's been an ulcer somewhere, and it's maybe below these hemorrhagic crusts. So there is, a hem there is an ulcer here, or ulcers are formed. And ulcers are loss of the epidermis through the basement membrane. And probably there's alopecia. I think it's subtle. You may not easily appreciate it in this short coat breed, not heavily hair, but there's some mild alopecia here as well. And that's an important distinction. Whenever we find papules clinically, we're trying to sort out if those papules are follicular centered or not. Because we're trying to sort out if the papules are related to follicular disease and folliculitis or they're related to some other cell infiltrate or accumulation within the skin and that helps really separate our list of differentials quite dramatically. And how we do that is look to see if well do these papules have a hair shaft come out of the center um, or not. If they do, <clears throat> you know, that, that's not easy to capture because if they're follicular centered the hair is often lost and so we're looking for concurrent alopecia that's most dramatic in the papular areas. So when you see follicular center papules, that supports folliculitis. When you see follicular center papules with a hemorrhagic exudate, that supports furunculosis. The furunculosis is in a dramatic inflammatory reaction, destroys a portion of the dermis next to the follicle, leads to loss of the epidermis and hemorrhage from that exposed dermis. And so in our patient, we have pretty good evidence just by our visual, ob visual observations that there's a folliculitis and furunculosis present. And our main differentials here, based on the presentation, is eosinophilic folliculitis and furunculosis of the face. Dermatophytosis could present very similarly. And maybe you could have a bacterial deep pyoderma causing a folliculitis and furunculosis here, possibly with edemacosis as a component. 
but demonicosis usually has more alopecia than this case that we see here. But it's an important distinction for the first two differentials because one will require immunosuppression or, or anti-inflammatory uh, steroid treatment and the second will require antifungal treatment and quite uh, diametrically opposed treatment options for our main differentials. So our biopsy approach for this we want to center the papules in a punch biopsy. You want to, when you use a punch biopsy, you really want to center any lesion within that punch biopsy. That's the appropriate method for that um, approach. And you want to collect multiple biopsies. So small lesions are hard for histologists to capture in histologic section, and the multiple biopsies ensure that some of them actually make it in our four micron sections. Of course, we're on the face, and we want to avoid important facial structures like the facial nerve, et cetera. And the diagnosis in this case was eosinophilic folliculitis and furunculosis of the face. And that's an acute rapid onset, usually considered to be an allergic disease, um, allergic reaction, for which the actual trigger is not really known. It may be more multiple triggers, it might be an arthropod-induced injury, but um, it remains unclear in the literature. We'll move on to case three, domestic short hair cat, six years old female spade as a six months ago had scratching of the head and ears and then started to lick his abdomen. The cat presented with these lesions on the ventral abdomen. See multifocal and coalescing lesions that if we look at them more closely, you can see that most of these are plaques. These are, this is kind of our best examples of plaques, of, of skin lesion type of a plaque in veterinary medicine. And these are raised flat top lesions greater than a centimeter. Some of these are papules, they're less than a centimeter and rounded, and, some, and many of these are essentially all of them have erosions and ulcers with a wet granulated surface on the top. You can see all of these lesions. Similarly, some there on the margin, you can see some epithelium intact. It's kind of white, more opaque and smooth as opposed to the ulcerated eroded areas that are wet and granular. And here the erosions and ulcers are probably secondary to self-trauma. The main differential here is an eosinophilic plaque, or the, the, this, the syndrome of eosinophilic plaque in cats, and with a secondary superficial bacterial pyoderma, kind of that moist exudative component to the lesion. <clears throat> there really isn't another uh, clear differential in this case. And so you may be confident from the clinical presentation that of what this condition is, and a biopsy is not necessary. It provides us with an example of a, of a plaque type lesion and how you would approach a plaque for a biopsy if you're faced with one you're unsure of. If you're unsure of the severity in this case, well, you may want to biopsy it or you may be more certain and not want to biopsy it. But for a, for a plaque, a wedge biopsy at the edge going into the plaque uh, center is an appropriate biopsy technique. Or in small plaques, you want to excise them completely, maybe with a centered in an eight millimeter punch biopsy or a small wedge biopsy to remove it exactly. Here, I think the cytology of the plaque surface would help you make a diagnosis and produce a large number of eosinophils as well as neutrophils and bacteria. And that would be sufficient information to help make a diagnosis with this clinical lesion type, particularly since the patient has evidence of, of licking um, and self-trauma and pruritus. And these are allergic, these are, um, allergic reactions in cats that are kind of unique to cats. But in contrast, there's our case four is an orange tabby cat, five-year-old male castrated that developed facial lesions for three to four weeks, recent episode of upper respiratory disease and non-paritic. And if we look at this cat um, close up, you can see that there are really prominent ulcers. The hemorrhagic crusts help give away that those moist areas are ulcers. And then you can also see centrally that there are pale, smooth areas that um, are consistent with a mild scar response and there's alopecia in these areas. And this a kind of combination of lesions suggests a migrating ulcer with healing centrally and developing a new ulcer at the, at the margin of the lesion for that. And so really in this case, in contrast to our self-trauma cases, ulcer seems to be the primary problem, developing scar later with healing and alopecia and hemorrhagic crust being a clue to the ulcer as a problem. So the differential diagnosis here in this cat is feline herpes virus ulcerative dermatitis is the main differential. I suppose self-trauma from a pretty skin disease might uh, induce some similar lesions. Usually they're more linear than this. There's no history of a pretty disease, but not always does the owner or the client know of the true pretty nature of the problem. 
And I suppose physiochemical injury causes a necrosis of the epidermis of, of different kinds and might cause an ulcer as well. But there's a very strong clue here to the feline herpes virus ulcer dermatitis as the diagnosis, and that's that the ulcers contact the mucous membranes. So when the ulcers contact the mucous membranes of the eye or the nares, as in this case, that's a strong clue that there's spread of herpes virus infection from the conjunctiva across the skin surface and creating the ulcer. To try and confirm that diagnosis, we would do wedge biopsies. And for ulcers, we do wedge biopsies 90 degrees to the leading margin of the ulcer. Here around the face, we're going to try to avoid facial structures like the lacrimal duct. And while there's a beautiful ulcer on the side of the face, it's in an area that is at more risk for injuring underlying structures. The diagnosis in this case is feline herpes virus ulcer dermatitis. And so there is a caution there um, that this lesion has a large number of eosinophils within it. It can be misdiagnosed by a pathologist as allergic skin disease, and then these patients may get immunosuppressed or have anti-inflammatory steroid treatment, which leads to more severe lesions and progression of the lesions. And so not everything with eosinophils uh, in the skin is an allergic skin disease, and so you just want to be aware of that, particularly in this presentation when it occurs on the face. As a general principle of buying ulcers, there are many ulcers in dermatology that are secondary that are of no use for biopsy, and the surgical biopsy results provide you just confirmation that you found an ulcer, and it doesn't help illustrate or, or elude to the underlying cause. But when we have primary ulcers um, suspected in our, our patients clinically, we're really after two specific areas, the epidermal margin of the ulcer, and there necrosis causes the ulcer, or we're looking for vascular disease deep in the central area of the ulcer is of no value to biopsy the superficial portion of ulcerated areas in the center. Those will not help at all. And granulation tissue and ulcers of any cause look very similar. But the deep central portion may be of help to find a, a vascular lesion. So this leads to the biopsy recommendation of taking a wedge biopsy through the margin with the widest portion of the wedge, capturing as much of the margin as possible, and then going deep into the deep central area of the wedge to hopefully capture vessels. And this allows the histology lab to orient the wedge biopsy along its long axis and get a perpendicular cut through the ulcer margin um, to get optimal histology for your case. So we were we were talking about biopsy of ulcers, and um, right. we were saying that if you're going to use a punch biopsy, it's going to be suboptimal, uh, but that you should alert the lab to that to that um, possibility. So let's move on to case five in a German Shepherd dog, five-year-old male castrated. And this dog prevents for skin lesions on the pinnae and the mucocutaneous junctions of the lips and has no other systemic signs, other skin lesion problems. <clears throat> and if we deconstruct this case for the skin lesion types, the primary lesion here is a vesicle. Vesicles are fluid-filled uh, lesions on affecting the epidermis or the subepidermal area, and they're, they're less, by definition, less than one centimeter, as a contrast to bulla, which is a similar lesion but greater than a centimeter in diameter. There are also erosions and shallow ulcers present, and these are fragile lesions. So when we have vesicles in our, our veterinary patients, the epidermis is quite thin in veterinary species, and they rupture quite quickly from uh, incidental trauma. And then we end up with this erosions and ulcers as the dominant lesion in our patients, and many of our vesicular diseases show up that way as most of their lesion. When that serum uh, material uh, and possibly hemorrhage dries on the surface, we can see crusts uh, developing as a secondary lesion. Um, our differential diagnoses here for the symmetrical lesions on the ears and lips of this dog are essentially an autoimmune subepidermal blistering disease, as Dr. Bizikova covered. And here we're looking at bullous pemphigoid, mucous membrane pemphigoid, and epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita. And probably mucous membrane pemphigoid and epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita are the most likely diagnoses. Bullous pemphigoid being quite rare and lesions usually being larger. And so our biopsy approach for this particular type of lesion for a vesicle, we'd probably biopsy the lip with a punch biopsy for small vesicles and with a wedge biopsy for large vesicles. The key part here is to keep the vesicle intact. When we rupture that and lose the roof, we'll have an erosion and it won't be particularly diagnostic. And so we are, we are doing everything we can to keep the vesicles intact. 
Now there are many valuable and good lesions on the ears of this patient and those are maybe best assessed by a shave biopsy and basically taking a flat large razor blade coming parallel to the skin surface and just dipping below into the superficial dermis to capture the lesion. The diagnosis in this case by biopsy is a subepidermal autoimmune blistering disease with the most likely differentials being the same as the clinical ones, MMP, the, the mucous membrane pemphigoid, epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita or bullous pemphigoid, kind of in that, that order of commonality. And as Dr. Gizikova pointed out, the surgical biopsy helped confirm the class of disease or the group of disease for you, and that has value. So we are going to immunosuppress these patients um, with these groups of diseases, and we want to be confident that's what we're dealing with. But it doesn't separate out the specific individual diseases for you, and that's the clinical presentation. The lesion type, size, and distribution on the body and signalment will help you uh, rank those different uh, different differentials. And here, uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid is maybe most likely. So you just want to remember on a shave biopsy, shave biopsies capture only to the superficial dermis, and the shave biopsies are only used to differentiate or identify epidermal lesions. So our differential diagnoses have to include diseases that only affect the epidermis or, the, or that uh, basement membrane zone and anything more superficial. None of our dermal or panicular diseases are benefited by a shave biopsy. Biopsy of pustules is essentially the same. We're doing the same approach as a vesicle. We're trying to keep that pustule intact. So a punch, lesions centered in a punch biopsy for small pustules and lesions centered in a wedge biopsy for large pustules will be our approach. Case six, this is a mixed breed dog, four years old male castrated with a one year history of nasal lesions and no other skin lesions. Here, the skin lesion types present are depigmentation. It's quite extensive off the, uh, along the dorsum of the nasal planum and a little bit on the rostral areas. There's epidermal atrophy, so the epidermis is thinned right out. Normally, it's quite thick on the nasal planum. And importantly, there's loss of epidermal surface architecture. So that normal cobblestone nature of the nose is now becoming smooth has, and has lost its normal architecture. That's an important clue to see that um, depigmentation, atrophy, and loss of surface epidermal architecture at the same time. Some lesions in these areas are a little bit worse and are probably some small erosions developing here as well as maybe a little bit of crust formation for that. <clears throat> Our differential diagnoses are not very long. It's discoid lupus erythematosus and maybe a chronic mucous membrane pemphigoid where we have rehealing and depigmentation and the vesicles are not been captured. What we're not considering here are some other depigmenting things on the nose. So it's important to recognize that when there's loss of surface um, epidermal architecture in the context of epidermal atrophy and depigmentation, that suggests an epidermal damaging disease like lupus, like a mucous membrane pemphigoid, maybe a VKH if we have ocular disease at the same time. If we have at loss of epidermal surface architecture plus depigmentation but epidermal expansion or filling effect, now that is caused more by a cellular infiltration of the epidermis leading to the depigmentation, expansion, and smoothing. And our differential diagnosis is primarily epitheotropic lymphoma, which is quite different. Although they both present with depigmentation and, and smoothing of the nasal uh, planum, the, the expansion component suggests a different process for that depigmentation and smoothing. What if we have no epidermal architecture change at all, but we have depigmentation? And here we're looking at primarily melanocytic damage then without the epidermis being injured, and that's a sign of vitiligo. So we can help sort those out, and those ones probably aren't benefited via biopsy. <clears throat> so in our patient, an approach for uh, a biopsy for this would be a wedge biopsy, similar to um, an ulcer or an erosion. We want to biopsy depigmented areas at their margin kind of 90 degrees. And it's important that we focus on the erythematous areas. This is a chronic lesion with lots of inactive areas and where it will be difficult to capture um, the actual underlying process on histology. But the erythema gives away where the active inflammation is. And then we want to focus on epidermal atrophy and that smoothing of the architecture. So some of these areas in here on the center of this nose are quite valuable for a biopsy. Uh, as they capture those, those different features. We want to avoid this area. I get many biopsies from the haired area near a nasal planum lesion. I think people are hoping that we'll capture also the lesion there, 
but um, ultimately those most of those lesions are non-diagnostic and so we want to decide if we're going to biopsy the nose or not and if we are to go right in there and capture the lesion centrally. This nose does have scarring, it will be deformed if we don't get it under control and so an argument for a scarring lesion in the nose is, is not very valid. The biopsy will come back with lupus tissue reaction pattern. So all the lupus tissue reaction patterns that target the epidermis are quite similar regardless if they're systemic lupus or one of the variants of cutaneous lupus. And it's the fact that the lesion is restricted to the nasal planum and there's a lupus reaction pattern that gives it away as discoid lupus erythematosus. But we need to know the clinical distribution to get to the specific lupus type that we might be considering. Biopsy of cutaneous hemorrhage. So it's not done very regularly, but when it is done, you should rule out clotting abnormalities first, of course. Confirm this actually hemorrhage by dioscopy. You can see small red macules on the skin surface on this image, and the dioscopy is pressing the slide against the surface and trying to blanch the lesion. If it doesn't blanch and the red cells stay there and leave the red macule under the the um, microscope slide, then that dioscopy shows it to be true hemorrhage. If we're going to biopsy those, we're essentially trying to search for vasculitis. And hemorrhage comes out and spreads away from vasculitis or vascular injury, and so the vascular lesion is in the center of the hemorrhage. So in small lesions, we're going to punch biopsy the center of hemorrhage, and in large areas of hemorrhage, we're going to use a, a wedge biopsy to get deeper and try to get to deeper vessels. It's important if you do decide to go after hemorrhage and look for vasculitis by biopsy that you take many biopsies. Vessel lesions tend to be focal on a vessel, they tend to be small, and they tend to be very difficult to capture in histologic section. So here's a case where you want to get as many biopsies as you can if you're going to try and capture that. Our case seven, we've got a miniature schnauzer, three years old female spade with a history of losing hair over four to six weeks and most claws are abnormal on all feet. And so well, let's look at some of these uh, individual lesions on the patient and the ear tip margin, there's an area that's kind of dark brown, it suggests maybe, maybe it's firming up, it suggests a little area of early necrosis or maybe it's evolving to a little crust but that location on the ear tip margin is a clue to a possible vascular lesion. And so we, we want to take note of that even though the lesion is not very dramatic, its location is very important. If you combine that with the alopecia on the tip of the tail, another extremity lesion, and abnormally formed claws or anechodystrophy is also another extremity lesion. And here most of the claws are affected by an irregular deformed surface and maybe sloughing of some of the claws. This patient also has a nodule on its shoulder Nodules are raised, rounded lesions greater than a centimeter are always considered to be primary. It also appears that the nodule is quite hyperpigmented and that there is some alopecia around that. On the neck, we have an area of alopecia as well as hyperpigmentation, whereas the hyperpigmentation is essentially always secondary. The fact that this non peritic patient has alopecia um, developing early in the course of disease suggests that the alopecia is also primary. So our differential diagnosis in this case, because of the extremity um, localization of the lesions, alopecia, um, we're considering a vascular-based disease and vaccine-associated ischemic dermatopathy is our top differential with a vaccine injection site reaction at the shoulder causing the mass type effect. We can see uh, some patients develop dermatomyositis-like disease. These are breeds not typical of dermatomyositis, hence it's dermatomyositis-like disease, but they have otherwise don't have a vaccine history suggesting that they have a more spontaneous disease. And it's always possible that we might have a combination of diseases, one causing the nodule and another one causing some of these other lesions, and a biopsy might help sort that out. Our biopsy approach here is going to center on the skin lesions. So if we look in this set of pictures here, when you're dealing with a patient where most of the claws are affected and there are other skin lesion types present in addition to the claws, then really we want to biopsy those skin lesions and not the claws. Those will usually give away a diagnosis and they'll be just as good as the claw. The claw is a hard area to biopsy and a difficult area to do histology on. And we're thinking about vascular-based diseases, dermatomyositis, and possibly a few other diseases when we have almost all the claws affected on a dog and there are skin lesions. What if you have only claw lesions? The dog on the bottom, almost all the claws are affected, even some of them are sloughing. There's no other skin lesions on the dog. Well, the primary differential here is lupoid anechodystrophy. And these are um, 
this is a reaction pattern on the clause, similar to lupus. It's essentially a syndrome. But there's no other real uh, main differential for this presentation, and a biopsy is usually not recommended. And really, you can progress on to treatment. So in our patient, a biopsy approach would be complete excision of the nodule. That'd be the ideal way to deal with a nodule. Or it might wedge biopsy from the nodule from the edge in through to the center. But for a vaccine-induced reaction, uh, uh, it is key that we get the center of the nodule. So we may want to have center to the edge, like most nodules, but make sure we include that center component. For the alopecia part, we want to biopsy all alopecia in the center. So we want the most developed area of alopecia, and we want multiple biopsies. And it's ideal with fully alopecia skin to mark a line of the hair growth on the skin and biopsy through that permanent marker line on the skin surface. And that allows for sectioning later. Here, um, we just have the hair pushed to the side, and so we're going to say the hair growth mark direction goes from dorsal to ventral, and we've marked that direction on the biopsy. It's also a useful biopsy one normal, similar area of the body where there is full hair. And this allows a pathologist to separate out the differences in hair follicle cycling that might be contributing to al alopecia or to look for more subtle changes on hair follicles and have a kind of control to compare to. So I just want to point out that in I get biopsies from alopecia all the time, and there is a tendency to apply a generalism to biopsy, which is biopsy the margin of anything. And this leads to failure in most of our alopecia cases. Most people consider the margin of alopecia to be the partially or haired area at the margin. And what we mostly get, if you look in this diagram, when we biopsy that area is normal hair follicles. Or we get partial cycling changes and some normal cycling changes, and we're unable to differentiate which one is the actual problem. And if you look at where the abnormal follicles are in our alopecia lesions, the center of the lesion contains the most affected hair follicles. We don't see those, the hair shafts are not present, but that's the, the highest density of affected follicles, whereas the margin where there's still hair growing are very few. If we keep in mind that many alopecia diseases are multifocal on the hair follicles, not every hair follicle is affected. So we're really struggling to capture the most diseased follicles when we biopsy alopecia, and that's in the center. There's an added complication of biopsying alopecia that, that affects how many hair follicles we get that are, that are useful. And here, we just illustrate what happens to your surgical biopsy when you send it to an histology lab. If you capture an eight millimeter punch biopsy, it's large enough for a histology lab to, bot, to section in half, to trim, and to give us two sections for a pathologist to look at. And we'll end up with, say, four to six hair follicle units. If you take a five millimeter punch biopsy or smaller, that's too small for a lab to cut in half to give us kind of two, two and a half millimeter pieces to do histology on. So they'll leave it intact, throw it into the cassette, and they'll just section into it. And we get one little piece of tissue to look at and very few hair follicle units. So we get a completely inadequate sample. So this leads us to say hair follicles, uh, affected hair follicles are hard to hit. In histology, we need more of them. So you need to take lots of biopsies that are eight millimeters from the center. And this picture just kind of illustrates what a pathologist gets if it's adequately biopsied and how many hair follicles we get and how many might be affected versus what we get if you biopsy something three, four, five millimeters and give us three punch biopsies. We have very little material to work with. And that, biopsy, that patient may need to be re-biopsied and attempt to capture enough affected follicles uh, to assess. It is useful to um, the histology lab and the pathologist that if you have fully alopecia care and the orientation of hair growth can't be observed from the skin surface, that you mark the orientation of hair growth visible on the body of the patient in the area of alopecia. And you biopsy through that permanent marker line with your punch biopsy, um, and that will allow us to trim it in the histology lab in the orientation of hair follicle growth and see the full hair follicle on histology rather than a tiny cross section by oblique trimming. So we're gonna uh, come up to our last case, case eight. This is a domestic short hair cat, eight years old, female spade. This cat has a history of draining lesions over the ventral abdomen for eight weeks. And if we assess these skin lesions, we have ulcers present. They seem to be multifocal and small. 
But importantly, when we palpate in here and investigate this lesion, there's a fluid exudate coming from these ulcers, indicating that really there's a draining tract below the ulcer and it's a more significant lesion. And that exudate is accumulating on the skin surface as, a, as the wet uh, fluid that we see amongst the hair. And if you palpate this lesion, that there are palpable nodules deep in the paniculus and the uh, below the skin surface that are not readily visible um, to the eye. Our differential diagnoses for this are essentially paniculitis, paniculitis, paniculitis. It's just different causes. On the ventral abdomen of cats, classic causes are nocardia, actinomyces, or atypical mycobacteria causing deep panicular infection. And this is what we're trying to hit. Our approach to biopsy these lesions is a similar for any panicular lesion. You want to biopsy all panicular lesions in the center. And this is important because edema and fibrosis will often firm up the, the paniculus at the edge of a lesion and you're unable to palpate the true edge of active lesions in the paniculus. If you biopsy what you think is the edge of a panicular lesion, thinking to biopsy everything at the margin, you will get edema, reactive vessels, maybe fibrosis, and we'll miss the primary lesion. And so in order to hit the center of lesions, we want to biopsy the center of paniculus. In order to get deep enough, we need to do a wedge biopsy. Punch biopsies just do not access the paniculus adequately. And of course, infectious disease are top on our differentials here. So cytology would be helpful to look for infectious agents and wedge biopsy for culture. Some people might aspirate these lesions and submit the aspirate for culture as well. And that just depends on your laboratory and your process. So it's just important to remember that punch biopsies access the superficial paniculus barely and are not useful for um, sampling panicular lesions. So for the paniculus, we always want to do a wedge biopsy and we want a wedge biopsy in the center. This was a recent patient that I received a couple of weeks ago. And you can see just from looking at the patient from afar that there's marked deformation of the skin, large ulcers and draining tracts with hemorrhagic exudate. And you can appreciate quickly that this patient has a panicular based deep lesion. All the punch biopsies that came from this patient uh, were punch biopsies. And what happened there is very typical of lytic and draining tract lesions in the paniculus. The punch biopsy captures the top of the lytic lesion. The lytic component of, this, of the lesion falls off of the biopsy. There's very little integrity of a lytic lesion and the punch biopsies are too small to capture enough to hold it intact. And so that part falls away and we end up with the cap or the roof of draining tracts with almost no diagnostic material when you attempt to biopsy lytic panicular lesions with a punch biopsy. So here um, the patient is scheduled to come back in for a biopsy and to do wedge biopsies because there's significant concern for deep infection, either bacterial, such as mycobacterium, um, or fungal. This would be a good case for a deep fungal infection as a rule out. So I hope I can leave you with a little advice for biopsies um, as a parting statement. I go to the clinic quite regularly to help with biopsies or to see biopsies taken. And I think we all feel sympathy or empathy for the patient. And we, we, we tend to want to collect as few biopsies as possible from a patient to be less invasive or maybe somehow less harmful to a patient. And that really leads us into trouble. What we should do is maybe feel more afraid to collect small samples and that those are inadequate, we miss a diagnosis and fail our patient. We usually only have one chance to get a good set of biopsies and we need to go and get an adequate sample the first time. And what I tell my veterinary students here at the college is to go safely, go big, or don't go. If you're unable to go and get a biopsy and get an adequate sample for that patient, maybe it's not time to biopsy the patient. But when it is time, then we go ahead and collect a sufficient sample. And that will increase our diagnostic success. We'll get a diagnosis on the first time and we'll reduce the pain and suffering uh, for our patient. So for that, I want to thank you and uh, thank my colleagues, Dr. Petra Bizikova, Thierry Olivery, and Luke uh, Beko in Belgium for providing many of the clinical images. And uh, if thanks. Thanks so much, Keith. That was fantastic. Um, really, really useful. I think it was interesting you were you were talking about um, obviously using antibiotics before taking biopsies but then sometimes we have these cases like the case number two with the folliculitis furunculosis you almost because it's kind of an emergency setting sometimes you have to break that rule and just 
take a biopsy, would you agree? Or I, th I think so, and I think on that, on case number two, if there was um, a cytology, intervening cytology step might have helped provide a clue towards the eosinophilic parenchylosis of the face versus dermatophytosis. Both of those can be eosinophilic, and the yes. little cytology would have said, well, this is not typical pyoderma, it has lots of eosinophils, let's do a punch biopsy. The, yeah. the cytology doesn't capture dermatophytes very well and address that rule out very quickly, and so the punch biopsy, I think, is still valuable. That's super. And then, as you say, with case three, with the eosinophilic granuloma complex, if you've got, an, they really are, you know, in that sort of situation, most likely to be more from an allergic case. And as you'd said yeah. before, you know, how many perivascular, superficial perivascular right. dermatitis do we need to get back before we right. decide that that's probably not a good sample to send off? Exactly. Those are, we, we haven't helped separate the differentials anymore with our biopsy than they were clinically before the biopsy. Yes. Yeah, I, I think there is a tendency certainly, you know, with, with that to refer cases to me to, to do that. So I think a great message. And uh, so thank you so much for a great presentation. Mm -hmm.